Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night to everyone, wherever you may be across our particularly lovely world. Thanks so much for joining us live here today for the one and only Serverless Office Hours. We are streaming on the AWS Twitch channel on YouTube Serverless Land and also via LinkedIn Live. So wherever you're joining us, thanks for uh, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Julian Wood. I'm a developer advocate for Serverless here at AWS. And I'm joined by, well, it was meant to be two stellar API people, uh, Zach and Daniel. Uh, Zach had an unfortunate uh, accident yesterday um, doing a sporting kind of thing, so <clears throat> we have to miss Zach, unfortunately. Uh, Zach, you will be missed. So, um, Daniel, we are welcoming your um, your uh, contributions. You were going to do it with Zach anyway. Uh, yeah, you, I, I'm a wood and you're a woods, so you probably have double the ba brain power, so they give you an extra S at the end of the name. But, um, yeah, welcome to Serverless Office Hours. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Julian. Uh, great to be here, finally. Yeah, absolutely. And so tell us, you know, what, what's your journey been to AWS? How have you landed up being a solutions architect and doing what you're doing today? Oh, wow. <laughs> it's um, It's been a long, long journey through AWS. So um, I am a solutions architect, uh, I guess, just for, for anyone who's not really in the know or familiar with, with what we do here for the SA Zoo in AWS. Uh, we essentially provide like in-depth guidance and, and, and architecture design mm -hmm. to any of our AWS customers, either directly through customer engagements, uh, one-to-many large-scale events, such as workshops, uh, summits, immersion days, and so on. And I've been with AWS for about seven years now. Uh, wow. And I've worked with a number of different customers across you know different sectors within the UKI um, geo, um, and also like SMB as well. So yeah, happy to be here. Ah, oh, cool. So yeah, you're a good veteran at, uh, of AWS at seven years. That is, um, that's a good innings. Well done. <laughs> Well, um, just before we get back to Daniel, who's going to be talking all things API, let's just have a quick look back on the previous world, a previous week of the world of serverless, not the world of the week of serverless. Uh, last week, we were talking all about Lambda and performance tuning. Really great stream with uh, Luca Mesidero and Matt Diamond. And that is on our YouTube serverless channel, youtube.com slash serverless land, along with all previous serverless office hours streams. So yeah, loads of information. Lambda performance was uh, last week, but there are years of great content you can uh, catch up on. Uh, in terms of things that are not new, uh, the second one down is actually probably the big interesting thing from the past week. Lambda now supports .NET 8. And this is, you know, .NET is just huge out in the world. Lots of people are building uh, Lambda applications are using .NET. Uh, .NET 6 was a long-term uh, long service release, .NET 7. I'm mumbling over words. .NET 7 wasn't, so we didn't actually come out with a managed runtime for .NET 7, although, of course, you could build Lambda functions with container images using whatever you like. And so, yeah, the next long-term support, .NET 8, is out. Uh, plenty of great content out there. Much faster, just so many cool things with uh, uh, compile time uh, things and everything. And next week on Serverless Office Hours, we'll be talking uh, more things about .NET 8. So that is super cool. Um, and some blog posts that have been recently coming out. Well, yeah, um, uh, uh, Bogos and Paris uh, Jane talking about the .NET runtime with all the sort of uh, various ramifications and the cool things they've done in .NET and also some of the cool things to do um, uh, with Lambda. And of course, if you are replatforming Java applications with uh, using web applications with Java, use, you can use the AWS serverless Java container. And Dennis has put a, a really cool blog post together on all of that. Uh, some events are coming up. It is sort of getting close-ish towards uh, AWS summit season. And uh, yeah, as Daniel mentioned, you know, speaking out at summits, these are, some of these are massive events where we get to uh, talk about various kind of things. I'll actually be speaking at the London summit on the 24th of April. Uh, but yeah, wherever you are, a lot of, a lot of them are in Europe at the moment. Um, there are going to be some ones added later on in the year. But yeah, this is the Canada, as far as I know it, for uh, summits coming up. So yeah, uh, a great opportunity to um, catch up with all things going on at AWS. Um, <clears throat> a little bit sort of smaller, I suppose, in scope than a huge big summit, but uh, GoTo is a partnership with uh, between uh, that uh, the AWS is doing with uh, the GoTo conference circuits. If you've heard about GoTo um, ones in, I think they've done in Chicago and Amsterdam and everything, and Copenhagen, really excellent conference uh, for, based on developers. And we're doing a specific EDA day with them on London on the 14th of May. So it's going to be CodeNode in London, 14th of May, all things to do with event-driven architectures. Uh, we've been looking literally at all the talks at the moment. There are going to be some fantastic speakers. We did uh, go to London, I think 18 months ago, and it was sellout, absolutely fantastic. So please get your tickets now, uh, register today, and yeah, it'd be super great to see you. It's really going to be super interesting, all about event-driven architecture. 
Some learning guides that people have put together, Anton and Debasis have been putting together, building service applications with Terraform. Terraform is absolutely huge. And so there are really uh, some good information on using Terraform. I keep forgetting to put the link on, but it's on serverlessland.com slash learn. And then you can uh, search over there and that's where the, all the learning guides are. Um, and also step functions with containerized workloads. Uh, Uma Ramadas has put this together. So this is really good using step functions as the orchestrator and then connecting to uh, container workloads, not just uh, things like Lambda. So super useful. But this week, we are talking all APIs, and not just any APIs, API Gateway APIs, and we're talking about well-architected APIs. So, Daniel, tee us up. What are we, when are we talking about well-architected APIs, what are we talking about? Wow. It's, um, it's quite a complicated uh, situation we have here. Um, there's plenty of different ways we can well-architect an API. I, th I might as well actually start by just yeah, going yeah. through the, uh, the presentation here. Yeah, um, let's bring that up. Super. So also remember, of course, we are live here on Office Hours. So please send us your questions, send us your comments, even tell us where you're from. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but yeah, Daniel and myself, uh, you've got three woods, one singular wood and a double wood. So you've got three woods in effect. And, uh, you know, Zach in absentia. So yes, uh, let us uh, know what you're doing. Tell us uh, the cool kind of use cases you are building APIs with, and we'd love to hear from you. So, yep. <clears throat> so Daniel, just even before, I mean, this slide looks a lot busy. I don't know you're going to go into that, but what does well architected mean? Even before we get to APIs, you know, what what is the concept of well architected? Yeah, well architected is well what we've just uh, shortened the well architected framework to. Um, the concept of well architected is to um, mm -hmm. implement best practices into your applications or your architectures, and and, and we go we're going to go through a number of the different pillars behind uh, or in the next slide, mm -hmm. um, where we'll actually individually look at how these well architected pillars from uh, operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, cost mm -hmm. often and sustainability, how they actually apply to a serverless workload or or maybe more specifically an API. But um, yeah, yeah we, I mean, we can we can get started like with the just, I guess, the going through uh, what does a well architect API look like? Now, this is you know, one of Zach's slides and, and we're going <laughs> to, I guess, get the conversation started with a bit of a short presentation, mainly just to give us um, something to uh, hopefully promote some discord or discussion uh, on building uh, well architected, well architected APIs. Yeah, I just I love as well when you when we're talking about well architected that you also straight away reference best practices because some people are like well architected. Well, you know, it does that does that apply to me because sometimes arch, you know the architecture function happens at the beginning of design and the application. Sometimes it's sort of a little bit late. But when people say oh well architected, it actually means just our codified best practices of building in the cloud. People are like oh best practices, those are cool things I can do at any stage of my software development lifecycle or API lifecycle. So yeah, if you think of well architected as best practices there's so much that you can do and so much that you know particularly if you're using serverless services so much that we do on your on your behalf yep yeah absolutely um i know you mentioned this is a busy slide and apologize to people out there having to get their you know screenshotting this thing but uh don't <laughs> worry i i think it's personally a great way to uh get a high level overview of the many different features and integrations within within amazon api gateway um and i guess you know anyone out there to the serverless savants i well one of the things that stands out here is the sheer number of uh connected <laughs> services to api gateway yeah. Uh, so before we dive in, of course, one of the principles of serverless architecture is, of course, the the interconnectivity. You know that that ability to adopt a, a service oriented solution into the architecture. Being so, capable... I mean, this isn't yep. necessarily an architecture diagram of a single application. No. This is a you no know, the different options and things you can do. And because we know APIs can be so flexible, this is sort of showing you know all the different kind of things that you can do rather than oh, if I build a uh, well architected serverless API, this is what it has to look like. Exactly. You know, like the 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 goal, of course, for for serverless architectures would be able to go from you know your job zero to to, to sprint end without needing to create a any AMIs or or needing to spin up any unmanaged EC2 instances or you know any sort of systems maintenance required. We can we can use these service uh, services that are managed by by teams sitting somewhere in Seattle or Vancouver or, or you know around the world oh, yeah. uh, to actually maintain our infrastructure for us, which is which is one of the most fantastic benefits yeah. of using serverless. And in fact, uh, Kira FX, uh, thanks for joining us via YouTube. You said, you know, hello, would it still be well architected if the VPC wasn't private? You know, NAT gateways are expensive. And that's exactly it. So we're just showing on the slide all the possible integrations you can have. In fact, I, I would... I would tell you, please don't do all of them on the slide. You're not well architected if you don't do all of these kind of th things. Um, this is just to show where we can apply well architected goodness uh, as well. So please don't look at the slide and think I need to tick off all the other kind of boxes that I need to be uh, everything. But yeah, good point, Kira. Thank you. 
Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I'm coming from the day where we'd be implementing sort of Django frameworks on on uh, instances and and, and having yeah. to maintain the the systems behind them, uh, patching and hardening the the images themselves. Uh, me personally, you know, I'm 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 a lazy developer. You know, the, the less I'm responsible yeah. for, the better. You know, an API gateway is going to make our lives easier uh, when building out that front door uh, to a service based application. So so that's what we're going to start looking at here. Um, any 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 further comments, or we can we can jump into the sort of two different types of uh, of APIs that we're going to be seeing here, or well, maybe three. Yeah, the, the comments we have is also just people welcoming. I said, uh, tell us where you're from. Uh, Tata Sheba, awesome. I'm originally from South Africa. It's always lovely to see fellow South Africans. And uh, yeah, Luke Lee, who's uh, from UK in Reading. So that's I'm actually not in London at the moment. I normally am, but that's sort of down the road. But yeah, Luke did say he want we, we will have a chat about that. But want to hear how it deploys using IPv6, or, you know, IPv4, IPv6. So yeah, we will cover that. Yep. Uh, uh, as we get along. So yeah, thanks for your questions and comments. Great. Okay. So you know, there, there, there's two different types of API gateway that we'll be looking at: uh, HTTP and REST. And and in this slide, we're going to be looking at the REST type. Uh, but for the record, you know, don't get too hung up on the on the naming categories. You know, it can be a bit confusing. But generally, REST APIs are. Um, you know, well, it has been more feature rich in the past, uh, but but I do believe actually HTTP is actually catching up. Um, uh, but here in with with the REST APIs, we have three different types of deployments. We have our edge optimized here, uh, regional and private. So edge optimized ties in uh, the it ties in a sort of a, a CloudFront distribution or an Amazon CloudFront distribution into uh, b before the API. Um, to those who may be asking, what is CloudFront? Well, for now, it's, it's simply a content delivery network, a, a CDN. And the benefits of having CDNs in applications are, are huge, uh, largely to distribute the uh, caching locations to points of presence uh, closest to where your customers or where your requests are coming from. Uh, and with API Gateway, this is a great choice if you're planning to, to release your, your API across uh, many, many different geographies. Uh, but also, if you want to implement your own sort of CloudFront or, or content delivery network, on top of regional endpoints, this is also quite a good option too. Um, of course, you know, regional, uh, the next one down here um, is a type where you're largely intending to serve clients within the same sort of geographic region. You don't have that content delivery network by default in front of the in front of the API. But again, as I said, you can you're more than welcome to implement it yourself if you like to. And at the bottom, finally, you know, we have the private type um, uh, endpoints. Uh, it's particularly useful, you know, that le it lets you, um, I guess, ensure that your API is only available from within a specific virtual private cloud or, or from any, sorry, any virtual private clouds that you specify. Um, uh, and it can allow you to control um, access to your APIs using the, you know, the API gateway resource policy. So, um, you know, if you wanted to share your API with another account or or a specific VPC or subnet within your own accounts, uh, you'd be able to set a control list uh, within the API gateways uh, resource policy within the console to isolate the API from from sources that you uh, you don't actually trust. And a, a common question that I'm getting, I get when I, I talk about the the private APIs is whether or not it's possible to protect the uh, public APIs from the same concept. Well, you know, of course, yes, it is. It's possible to specify uh, allowed uh, side arranges for IP addresses either either via the other resource policy or or through uh, AWS Web Application Firewall uh, (WAF), you know, which can which can do that uh, and also protect your API against common scripting attacks and and, and so on. And all these APIs, you know, they uh, have the, they have the choice of enabling uh, CloudWatch monitoring down here, uh, and this allows you to track errors or, or debug uh, logs or you know, log all request responses to the API if you're if you're trying to troubleshoot any sort of authorization or integration issues as well. So you know that that might have been a bit of an information dump there, Julian. Um, is there any sort of particular questions from your side uh, on on any of these sort of different components, no. the differences between the API types or or the middle features here? No, I think that's uh, that's covered well. I think uh, you know people using private API endpoints as well for internal microservices. You know when they are you know building some small little microservices and they can use private APIs and then they just know that they're not available on the internet for everybody else, uh, which is also super useful. And yeah, just just loads of flex uh, flexibility over here. You did mention the sort of uh, HTTP APIs versus REST APIs. And yet we'll acknowledge the naming isn't the simplest because the HTTP APIs are also RESTful APIs, uh, but they're just, you know, different 
families of products uh, within API Gateway and HTTP APIs isn't quite as feature rich yet. We're hoping, you know, hoping to be able to build more functionality in there, but it's a little bit simpler to use uh, because it doesn't have all the features and it's a little bit cheaper. So if you are, you know, thinking about the difference, it's worth uh, knowing, uh, you know, what HTTP APIs can do for you potentially a lot. Uh, but if you need the, you know, API Gateway, the full RESTful API has got a whole bunch of things um, that, uh, you know, it's going to cost a little bit more, but maybe it's just going to be the kind of thing that it's going to give you, you know, protection and it's going to give you usage policies and blah, usage plans, sorry, and yeah, a whole bunch of things. Yep, super. Um, so yeah, next I'd probably like to talk a bit, bit about the integrations, but before we we do that, I, I think it might be good to talk about REST itself or, or of course, representational state transfer. You know, it, It's all about paths, resources, and, and, and methods. So within a single resource, we can specify different actions for any of the verbs, right? So get, put, post, delete, or options, even you know, if you're a fan of cores. Uh, and within these integrations, we can do many- Are you a fan of cores? Absolutely, it's it's, it's <laughs> for protecting your own your own resources. Yeah, um, once you know, and once it's all worked. Yeah, I think um, Eric Johnson, who you who who does a lot of the hosting on on serverless office hours as well, said, you know, if calls had a face, I would punch it. So, uh, <laughs> calls calls is one of those things. I think you. Uh, Great, great, great. Once you've worked it out, that it does take a bit of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the I guess the main point of core is right. You know, if you were hosting images through your API, uh, would you really want if someone else was to just copy that image URL to their website and then implement it into their into their website? You have exactly. to pay for all those requests, those the, the those yeah, binary exactly. downloads. Yeah, it's it, it makes sense to use cores. Um, of course, it's it's only enforced by the clients, by the browsers, but um, it's it is a standard out there. So. Um, yeah, I guess get used to it. If you are hosting anything online for the public without any authorization, cores is yeah. your best friend. Um, but of course, you know, uh, the, the verbs, you know, get, put, post, delete, uh, we can specify different actions and different uh, service integrations or different uh, Lambda functions based on on the verb itself. So, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to implement everything behind uh, into a single integration. Uh, you can, you can actually um, do many different things here. And within the integrations themselves, you know, we can check the authorization headers. We can check for API keys to implement usage plans, to transform the body using VTL mapping templates, uh, require that specific headers be either set or configured. Um, and then, of course, integrating with any of the other AWS services uh, natively, or even proxy the request through to a different HTTP service. You know, it could be a, an external a API if you wish to implement your own authorization on top of. Uh, of course, built-in Lambda integrations here, so you know that that Lambda can be used to maintain and manage that front end. Um, and yeah, we can always come back to the slide if we've if we've missed anything uh, crucial. So, you know, but, you know, this is just a bunch of stuff that's gonna, either going to come up again later, either by plan or or by conversation. So, you know, if you'd like to hear anything more about this slide, please let us know. Um, so, you know, you mentioned you mentioned pillars. Um, we have them here. Um, just, just, I guess, as, as a best sort of description, you know, well architected, uh, it's essentially the the bread and butter for for any solution architect, uh, and it should be yours too. You know, uh, anyone building, maintaining, or even contemplating building applications on AWS or, or in the cloud in general should take a look through the well architected framework. Um, to summarize, you know, a, a story in which I'll, I'll, I'll happily talk about until I guess the end of time if if I if I got to, um, we have six pillars of the well architected framework here. Uh, and we'll definitely put a serverless lens on, on this discussion and focus on how these pillars change when when applied to uh, services such as like Lambda and, and API Gateway. And in fact, so, I've just done a link on the screen, which which is in the chat as well. This actually is the serverless lens, lens of the well-architected framework. So that's a link on all the documentation, um, which you can reference that uh, later as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, some, some of these pillars uh, work better with the serverless lens and, and some less. So uh, we'll... we'll probably even see that ourselves when we're talking about sustainability or, or cost optimization. Um, but yeah, you know, no, no, numero uno here, you know, we got operational excellence, you know, how to ensure that your your operational readiness is in tip top shape. Um, many businesses daily, you know, reach out to our support teams um, with their critical problems, with their production workloads, production down issues. It's actually where I started my career in AWS was was in the serverless support teams in 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 support. So I've seen a lot of this. So I've seen I've seen a lot of bad operations out there. Uh, for for a serverless application to be sort of compliant with our operational excellence pillar, um, 
the supporting team must have heightened levels of visibility into each operational part of that architecture uh, from the uh, front end API or, or the resources, uh, how many HTTP errors are being returned and what are the error codes um, to the Lambda functions, you know, processing the requests. How are the exceptions being handled in the function code? Uh, how is the customer logging errors that result in, in fatal terminations of the runtime uh, or, you know, any unhandled exceptions? Uh, how does a Lambda function behave if a downstream service is impaired or, or offline? We'll, we'll mention a little bit more about this reliability later, but, you know, operational excellence, it's all about monitoring, being proactive to protect against any sort of system impairments and, and also being capable of reacting quickly to issues within your architecture uh, by having well thought out room books and or playbooks uh, that, that at your support team's disposal, uh, particularly for issues uh, that have already arisen within your platform. Or if you've seen them already, you should have a room book to actually respond to that event if you ever see it again. Make sense? Does make sense. Uh, I just need to check. I had um, I um, had put up your uh, LinkedIn information before, and uh, Ashley Taylor, um, who's joining us via YouTube, Ashley, welcome. Uh, the Daniel Woods on that LinkedIn link is not the same Daniel Woods as I'm looking at. <laughs> yes, yeah, we we, we do. I, I do have a colleague with the same name in in the UK. <laughs> No, but I think uh, I think this is the Daniel Woods that I've, I've hopefully I've got the right one. If not, um, are you Daniel W. Woods? I think so. Uh, I believe so. Yes. I, yeah. I am. There we go. Yeah. So slightly more bearded. I've also got longer hair. So yeah, hair grows. So uh, thank you, Ashley, for joining us. That is actually the Daniel Woods we are looking at. Yeah, I think that was my very first uh, AWS photo that I took. Uh, so I look eight years ago. You look a lot good. more green back then. Um, <laughs> Where are we? Security, of course. Favorite one. Um, you know, not not to sound too much like Werner Vogels. Uh, I believe he's the one who said, you know, security is 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 job zero at AWS. But it really is. You know, uh, you know, thankfully, serverless applications come with uh, uh, like things like resource policies and a number of authorization or authorization options. You know, particularly for for API gateway. Um, that we'll also look at in a bit. Uh, and locking down each and every avenue of attack every vector for a breach of your systems is paramount uh it's, it's a paramount task that never uh ends in the sort of operating workloads at scale uh sort of mindset um and if this is of interest to you i'd highly recommend taking a look at our security white papers uh and going directly to the security pillar in the well architected framework uh for more information on this um this course is, is a job we can't actually <laughs> avoid doing it's, it's one of the most important ones um Reliability. So you know, this is a big one. Um, it's all about sort of redundancy and recovery. Um, most services beyond the traditional sort of monoliths are made up of like a lot of different moving parts, a lot of different services. And of course, sometimes things do break. How best we can mitigate these disruptions to our operations and, and ensure that our customers rarely notice our, our service impairments is, is a very important part of this. Uh, services like AWS Lambda have some fantastic reliable engineering in place, uh, you know, th th those ephemeral execution environments um you know that ensures that any runtime crash causes the worker to be discarded so that your executions are always running in new environments um a step further you know we have aws step functions our in-house sort of workflow orchestration service uh, and this allows you to implement retry logic into our workflows and, and to handle sort of those event failures or uh, and retry them safely without having to discard any particular request and going a little bit further on this sort of um, this train of thought, we have SQS, you know, it's our simple queuing service. Um, it's another one of my favorites, of course, to implement into any sort of architecture that you're trying to decouple parts from, especially the ones that might break. Um, and I used to know one of the senior sysdevs from, from the SQS team, and he told me something, I think back in like 20, 2019 or, or, or so, uh, that the service had never lost a message in queue since op its operation, since it started. <laughs> Now, I, I, again, I I don't know if I'm misquoting him that or if that's if, if if that is public knowledge out there. But yes, SQS is highly reliable. I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's a question on anyone's mind. So, like, of course, you know, the service allow you to queue up your requests into into your uh, your application and then work through them in a somewhat ordered fashion. You know, allowing you to have. Um, you know, to, to force retries, uh, or instead of having to, sorry, uh, force retries from the client, you can you can take an asynchronous request at your API level, return back a, a 202 or an accepted response to the client, and um, work, you know, work on that request in your own time. Um, the 
avenue for response could be anywhere from, uh, I guess, the old school way would have been a, a sort of polling mechanism. Uh, some of our our um, deep learning services still actually implement this uh, this uh, get job status, or I don't know how you describe it. Um, but right now, I, I guess the, the best or alternative will be a webhook response, which we can implement in the likes of API Gateway as well. Um, I'll leave it here. Of course, you know, like we can always come back to reliability. It's a fantastic, uh, fantastic sort of pillar to discuss from a service-oriented architecture uh, perspective. Um, but we do have more to get on with here. Um, performance efficiency, and and you know, from a serverless perspective, one of my favorite examples um, of performance efficiency, and one of the quickest and easiest things that a developer can can do to implement this is implement AWS Lambda power tuning. So for those not in the know, power tuning is a template that you can deploy um, to your account that tests your Lambda function's ability to execute at different memory footprints. So when selecting you know, a memory size in the Lambda configuration, uh, those that slider of, of memory size does more than configure memory. It also controls access to the CPU, to the to the IOPS, and, and I also believe the, the networking access as well. Uh, and if there's any Lambda geniuses in, in, in the chat here, please let me know if I've forgotten anything anything here. Uh, but from you know other perspectives, we have um, Step Functions Express workflows, you know, for uh, those much shorter life cycles that can execute faster in comparison to a standard workflow. Um, and of course, you know, we're sorry, we're supposed to be talking about APIs. So, you know, we, we have to give a mention to the, the edge optimized APIs uh, and their in-memory caching of response objects. You know, uh, of course, regional API also has the option to configure your own do-it-yourself CDN uh, to cache responses in CloudFront as well. So, so plenty of different things to talk about in, in performance and reliability. Again, pick up the, the white paper, have a look at it, open up the serverless lens, the HTML page on, on, on the docs, and, and uh, follow along through while we while we continue to discuss these. Um, we've got cost optimization next, of course. Um, like fr from, the, from the top of my head, um, again, <laughs> apologies, I, I haven't had much time to look at these. Um, I guess proportionately allocating CPU and memory sizes to Lambda functions and, and being efficient with your resources overall. Serverless can can be, you know, it, by its nature it, it, of trying to be hardware efficient, it will do a lot of this for you. But there are other ways in which we can improve performance, you know, cost optimization and sustainability, um, maybe by queuing messages and batch processing them. Uh, within a single environment, potentially to avoid uh, increasing your idle concurrency count on Lambda. Um, you know, we're limited on what to advise regarding sustainability on serverless, uh, purely due to the paradigm trying to be efficient by itself. Um, but if anyone has any stories on how they've implemented sustainability into serverless, um, please feel free to share it in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, that it's something that I've actually written down to, to, to mention here, but... Um, Possibly even like you know adopting Graviton for AWS Lambda functions, you know, for for that better price of performance and and uh, the EC two EC two instances at least have a sixty percent less energy or they use sixty percent less energy in comparison to their X eighty six sixty four uh, cousins. So it's a it's a good point to to talk about actually. Um, but yep. Yeah. I think, uh, think that's pretty much it for the pillars. Is there is there any particular questions on on this, or will we will we jump on, Julian? Um, I think. Uh, well, actually, just <clears throat> a question. We may cover this later, which we can. But yeah, Chuck, thanks for joining us on YouTube. Can you say several words about well-architected systems based on CQRS? I know. Well, I suppose it is linked to APIs as well because you are, you know, um, command query re response system. I think I got the acronym uh, acronym correct. Correct. Um, I don't have any. I don't have any specific well-architected systems based on that. But I would say, uh, you know, you're doing a lot of API kind of things when you are split. Basically, CQRS is all about splitting the when you're sending an item and when you're querying an item. Um, all behind APIs. I don't know, uh, Daniel, anything else to add? Um, nothing there to add. Um, actually, to be honest, I wasn't I wasn't familiar with the acronym before today. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> yep. Yes. So CQRS is when you sort of split the, the sending of the data and the, and the reading of data. And that's a way that you can have a system that's more performant because... Uh, uh, for example, if, if you've got a, a database that uh, can handle a certain number of writes, um, 
but you have you don't have a, lo a lot of writes, but you have a huge amount of reads. You don't want to have to scale that database for a huge amounts of writes and reads altogether. You want to sort of separate that functionality. Um, so yeah, CQRS can be super useful. Um, I think that's going to the well architected um, things is going to be based on the kind of services you're going to use rather than actually on the CQRS pattern. But Chuck, if I have um, if I have misrepresented your question, please let me know. And uh, Charles is going to command query. Oh, responsibility segregation. That was a soft request uh, segregation. Thank you, Charles, for uh, correcting my uh, poor use of the acronyms. Uh, thanks for joining us as well. Um, we did have um, <clears throat> from Nicholas Orr, thank you from New Zealand. Uh, could we leverage, is this a question particularly from New Zealand? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, could, you, could we leverage API Gateway to migrate to a new implementation of the API? Like, would it give us a simpler way to steer traffic from old to new? Very good question. Yeah, so uh, you can do this with API Gateway. What, what you're probably referring to here is is a sort of a blue green deployment strategy, or or even the canary deployments that are built into the into the API Gateway service itself. Uh, you can do this across stages in your in your API Gateway deployment. Um, if you are trying to implement um, a something like an you know an account change through your APIs or or migrate from from another provider uh, without downtime, it would be theoretically possible to do this with the likes of Route 53 uh, using using Route 53 to um, wait. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, to, to oh. wait the traffic between the two endpoints. I, I see Nicholas actually had a second message as well. So the current plan is to use ALB uh, target group traffic percentage as we don't have a solid understanding of API Gateway. So, so a ALB, I would think, is going to be at a sort of lower functionality level where it's just going to route traffic based on you know your application profiles. API Gateway is going to have a whole bunch of functionality. So when your ALB is routing to something, uh, you're going to have some API functionality that's going to be you know, it could be Express, it could be Flask, it could be some sort of API proxy that it's heading to in your in your kind of service. Uh, API Gateway is able to take a lot of that functionality away, so you can run it sort of in a more sort of serverless way. Um, so plenty to know about API Gateway. If you want to know a good intro to API Gateway, and in fact, it's more than an intro, it's got a whole bunch of stuff. My colleague, Eric, who I was speaking about earlier, has done a, uh, has done a, a reInvent talk at our a big conference called I Didn't Know API Gateway Did That. So API Gateway, that's a really uh, you know, well done talk with lots of information about API Gateway. So I'd suggest you have a look at that. Uh, that's it for the for the questions. I think we can uh, carry on. We'll jump on then. Yeah, sure. So we're we're back to the the endpoint types of of API gateways here. Uh, up first, of course, edge optimize just to reinforce the 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 concept of the, of the different endpoint types. Edge optimize will implement a cloud front distribution in front of your API. And this, of course, will reduce the TLS connection overhead, uh, the round trip time to API Gateway itself. A, uh, cloud front distributions can, or the, the edge locations can maintain those uh, long lived connections to the service itself. Uh, and then your users can, can connect to that instead of so proxying the request through through the content delivery network. Uh, of course, it's designed for, for globally distributed sets of clients uh, because it's got that, that, that cloud front distribution in place in front of it. Um, while talking about that regional endpoints, of course, you do still have that control to implement your own client front distribution on top of that if you like. Um, other CDNs will also work. I uh, won't, won't mention too much about that, but you can also use any sort of CDN in front of your, your API gateway as well. Uh, it's also recommended for any sort of general use cases or, or, or regional specific requirements for your API. If you, want to, if you want to make it available within a specific geography, EU, UK, uh, US, you can you can run your APIs that way. And finally, I guess the most interesting or, the, or the, the coolest sort of integration that we have here is the private style one, uh, only making it accessible to, to access your API gateway through a, a VPC. Or networks, you know, connect to the VPC, of course, too, as well. If you have a transit gateway that's connected to your your on-premise through a direct, direct connect, we are, would be able to route those requests through as well. Um, it, it, of course, this uses VPC endpoints, so you could deploy a VPC endpoint within your your VPC and specify in the resource policy of the API to permit access um, to that VPC endpoint for for this this particular private API. So. Fairly simplistic to set up, uh, very useful as well. Um, one of the things that I love about the private API endpoint, and it's, it's one of the sort of niche use cases that I don't think gets used enough, Julian, um, is with this private API, right? Let's say we had a, a private VPC. We, we didn't, it, it totally isolated from, from the internet, but you know, yet we still needed to access a particular API, uh, Stripe or, or Twitch or something. I, you know, I don't know, any, any sort of public, public API service out there. It would be possible to use this private API endpoint type to um, effectively grant just that, um, just 
that API, uh, that that public API. Let's just use Twitch because I know they're they're one of our one of our partners. Um, we can access the Twitch API through API Gateway from an isolated VPC or an isolated VPC uh, with EC2 instance hosts in it. Uh, and this would allow us to do those sort of queries to the Twitch endpoint who's streaming or whatever it is uh, without actually opening up any any networking ports or, or allowing any sort of public routing to the internet um, just by proxying the request through private API Gateway. So it's, you know, it, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, ranting here but it's, it's one of the one of the use cases for API gateway that I, I personally love uh, and it's really cool to see what the, it in action itself yeah that just shows the flexibility of api gateway when you can do these cool kind of connectivity things where you can still be private in your vpc but then connect out to the, to the rest of the world yep yep allowing allowing specific sets of uh of urls uh, in the world to to access your private uh, network uh one way as well so really cool um authorization types you know um uh, you know, so so essentially, we can go through the different sort of types of authorization here. Um, these are for all the different types. You know, we we have a little uh, tags inside at REST and REST and HTTP here for the different uh, types of API that these are available for. Uh, I'll start top left here with the resource policy. So essentially, you know, this allows you to define a document um, that either allows or denies access to your API or or, or specific paths within the API. Uh, from either specified IP addresses, VPC endpoints, account principles, and, and so on. You know, it's probably the first line of defense uh, for the API uh, and can completely lock down an API alongside um, enforced IAM authorization as well to to users within your AWS, uh, AWS account itself. Um, I might as well talk about IAM next. Uh, so, you know, AWS IAM is, is, is that service that we all love and admire, you know, with its large quantities of, of, of permissions policies, boundaries, and contradictory rules. I'm, jo I'm actually joking. You know, I love IAM. You know, and, and your APIs should do too if you implement it on your methods. Um, we can control access to the API uh, via the resource policy to grant IAM specific um specific user access um, who have that sort of execute dash API permission um, policy attached to their to their user or to their group uh, so that you can treat your custom API just like you treat any AWS service. Of course, you know, one of the downsides of the trade-offs is you need to implement an AWS SDK or at the very least implement the signature V4, uh, SIG V4 uh, signing process in order to um, process your request on the service itself. So, so once, once you implement SIG v4, the service will be able to actually dec decrypt or decode that that, uh, that header and verify that your user or your access key has has access to the service uh, and so on. Um, Daniel, the, um, yep. with, um, I mean, IAM is obviously the, the bedrock of all of AWS, I think, and yep. it's worth time, you know, worth, worth people taking the time to understand it. And I, I, I don't mean this um, sort of negatively against IAM as well, but there's a heck of a lot it can do. Um, and sometimes it can get complex, because it is ultimately incredibly secure. I mean, there's no, you know, no, no issues with using IAM as all. Well. Would you say that, you know, from a simplicity point of view, even though IAM the service has can do a whole bunch of kind of things, if you can use IAM, and I'm thinking for internal APIs and that kind of thing, that's actually the best way to start, rather than using some of these other um, authorization techniques. Is that fair, or is there, is there more nuance in that? No, yeah, I, I, there is slightly more nuance, I think, Julian. Yeah. But it, no, that is, is absolutely fair. If you can use IAM, I'd highly recommend using using IAM. The of course, the trade off is for for us to use the IAM. Um, the IAM uh, authorization type is we do require IAM credentials on the on the client, and this might be a bit of a problem if your if your clients are are coming through your your own sort of web app or somewhere like that. Exactly. We, we yeah. might not have IAM credentials, and now of course you can still get them onto your clients via via you know your identity pools incognito if you if you require. Um, but you know if your clients are um, AWS resources. I'm just thinking, you know, EC2 instances that have access to the the yeah. um, oh those the the, the instance role. I've forgotten the name. The, oh, the yeah, meta, metadata. Metadata uh, service. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the metadata service. If you have access to that, perfect. You can you can get IAM credentials through that. Lambda functions and anything that has access to AWS IAM credentials. Of course, implement IAM uh, as well. There, there's no point of trying to implement two different uh, types of authorization when you're already using IAM on that service. Um, makes sense, right? Yep. Yeah, it does make sense. So yeah, if you can use IAM internally, um, that's going to be great. It means your, you know, your sort of permissioning is consistent with a whole bunch of other kind of things. So yep, 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, of course, we, we mentioned it before, you know, if you've got external sort of providers that, that you're trying to implement this to, web apps or whatever, uh, we have the the JSON web tokens, you know, J, JWT, uh, available for HTTP type APIs. But, you know, I'll try and keep this sort of generic enough so we're not talking about two different types of APIs all the time. Um, and we can also talk about, like, um, Lambda authorizers in here as well. So JWT is a commonly used format for specifying the claims of a request. Um, you know, it's part of the OpenID Connect, um, essentially the, 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 I'm forgetting the word. It's part of OpenID Connect, um, and it's a valid form of authorization implemented in any sort of OAuth provider, such as Cognito itself. Uh, and we can natively inspect the JWT uh, tokens within the HTTP APIs and, and, and search for the valid claims. Uh, but for REST type APIs, we'd need to implement our own authorizer function, uh, which allows you to um, inspect anything about the request from you know the metadata, the, the headers, um, to determine whether or not the request is valid. So of course, we could implement JWT in here as well if we needed to. Um, you know the, these lambda authorizers as well. They're they're fantastic for for I guess you know you can you can do anything in these. You can yeah. you can specify any sort of uh, type of a proprietary authorization mechanism well, if you require. Uh, they used it, to be it, called it, custom authorizers. So that was the original name for lambda authorizer was custom because you could do absolutely everything. So any, anything you like. I, I think you know one of the, my favorite ones is one plus one and have that in the header header and you can approve or allow or deny the request <laughs> based on that. But you know if you can describe your authorization pull process or you know the mechanism. Uh, in Python or Node or Java or Go or you know any of those any of those you know supportive runtimes or or even in a container of course uh, that you put in, into the Lambda service um, you can authorize around it you can you can allow that to be your how you how you build your API yeah. so uh, very useful um, what else do we have here mutual TLS of course. Um, so yeah, again, this is very specific to a type of um, a type of authorization similar to the AWS IAM. You know, if you if you've got a client that requires um, or that has IAM credentials, you can use IAM. Mutual TLS allows you to um, ensure that both both parties, both client and server, generally in in these sort of API requests, we only talk about the server side TLS. You know, the 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 certificate that's being passed from the from the service. Uh, and verify that, uh, verify the chain up, and, and uh, verify the, to verify the identity of, of the API gateway service as being part of the whole Amazon sphere. Um, but you can do the same thing with 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 um, um, with uh, mutual TLS as well for the clients as well. Um, is there anything we're missing here? Web application firewalls, fantastic. Um, Fantastic resource, of course. Uh, I, I'm not too sure if this would be in the authorization um, yeah, slide. Protection or... <clears throat> it, yeah, it, it's it's general protection for an API. You know, yeah. um, application firewall. So pre uh, preventing commonly uh, common scripting attacks or 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 attacks that we've seen, AWS have seen uh, against infrastructure. Trying to prevent those from taking place specifically to your API gateway. Uh, we can also implement our own rules if we want to deny. Um, IP addresses or or uh, allow from specific IP addresses, the web application firewall can do that for us as well. So uh, it's certainly a good one to to implement whenever you can. Yeah, Robert agrees. Robert Tables, thanks for joining us again. Um, WAF is awesome. I know. And yeah, I did say, uh, Robert also said uh, uh, previously, yeah, IAM is uh, secure, but uh, you know, can be diff can be difficult for an end user. So yeah, that's what I said originally. Uh, Adop, I IAM is the, you know, the bedrock of Adop. That's a silly term, the bedrock. So we have a service called Bedrock now, but uh, IAM is sort of the, uh, the fundamentals of AWS. So um, spending some time on that is super useful. Awesome. Well, we're on to caching, uh, a, a fun one with with API Gateway. Um, you know, when, when I was when I was first working with with API Gateway, I think this was back in 2017 or so. Um, I always misunderstood the edge optimized caching in comparison to CloudFront caching, which is completely different, you know? So with, with API Gateway caches, we, we have this sort of in-memory cache for, for response objects at the at the uh, endpoint level. Um, CloudFront, of course, can cache your responses at the, um, at the edge location, or sorry, at the, I'm gonna avoid saying edge location because edge optimized. We can cache it at the distribution, right? So, so at yeah. the point of presence of CloudFront. Um, so this can be a good and bad thing, of course. If we've got an authorization endpoint and, and we're required to authorize headers, uh, unless we're using something like Lambda Edge to do that authorization for us, um, we might potentially be caching 
uh, caching information that we shouldn't need to. So, of course, you need to manage your caching very, very wisely uh, so that you're only caching on resources or paths that can be cached on <laughs> and, and not caching uh, authorized resources, of course. Uh, it has happened before. Um, it can be a bit of a silly mistake to make. Uh, but just to be aware of that, of course, so regional endpoints, uh, you can cache through CloudFront. Uh, edge optimized endpoints can cache uh, at the API gateway level itself. Um, require authorization if you need to. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's pretty much pretty much all I have to say about that. Is there anything I'm missing here now, Julian? No, I think we're good. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> you know, caching is just the, like the concept of caching is super important because it basically reduces the the, uh, the load on your downstream services. So if you've got stuff you can cache specifically from an API, you invoking less Lambda functions and uh, doing less stuff, that's going to you know um, reduce your costs, save your money, and stuff's going to be fast. Like. Ta -da. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so instead of having to process a Lambda function to retrieve a document from DynamoDB, you know, if, if your service could accept a document that's five minutes old, we can set a five minute cache yeah. on the on the uh, CloudFront distribution, provided that that document doesn't have anything confidential inside of it. Uh, you know, the users can can access this document and this these future requests to users within that city or that geography uh, won't cost you any 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 computational resources to actually yeah. or or your um forgetting all my all my terminology your dynamo db reads <laughs> so and just quickly um, before we uh, uh, see some milk of our LinkedIn, can we get the recording? Yes, the recording is available. Uh, in fact, it's going to be available on all three platforms, but it's probably easier via youtube.com slash serverlessland. And the recordings are all there for posterity. So if you're frantically scrambling down notes, you don't need to. Uh, thanks for joining us, Isa. So uh, metrics, of course, a very important part of, of your operations is being able to define the metrics which are important to your uh, to your application. Uh, there's different built-in metrics for each of the um, types of API. Of course, so a, a, quick, a quick shout out to WebSockets because I, I think I only mentioned it once or twice before already. Um, WebSockets, uh, of course, allow you for that bi-directional communication between your application and your clients. Your clients can send messages to API Gateway without, um, or sorry, API Gateway can send messages to your clients without actually the client having to do that request itself. So fantastic for those, those times when you want to avoid sort of polling for an answer and instead you can open up a WebSocket connection and send the response back whenever you like. Um, I do believe they are charged by the minute, so keep an eye on that if you are trying to um, design an architecture around WebSockets. Yeah. Uh, they can get a little bit expensive, I believe. Uh, as can all metrics, excuse me. I think we were talking before the call today about, about how metrics and logging can be quite a pricey thing to do, Julian. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and just uh, before, because we'll, I know we're talking about logging uh, shortly, but we'll cover that. But actually, interestingly, for WebSockets, and I'm not going to um, moan about API Gateway at all, but interestingly, if you're looking at front end WebSockets, uh, another service to look at is AWS IoT Core. You're thinking, hang on, IoT Core, I don't have an IoT application, but IoT Core is another managed WebSocket service, and it's fantastic for web front ends because it can uh, reconnect that MQTT, uses MQTT, you can reconnect that connection and like super, super, super simple. So uh, yeah, super useful for doing um, front-end web application updates. Just another way of doing WebSockets if you weren't aware. Awesome. Um, I see an interesting question there in the chat. You know, uh, can, can we attach Elastic IP on yeah. API outbound interfa interface exposing to the internet? Um, so I, I assume you mean on the HTTP integrations for, for API Gateway. Uh, we won't be able to control that. I, I do believe, now quote me if I'm wrong, because I, I probably am wrong. Um, being an SA, you're all wrong for half the time, so don't trust us. Uh, but uh, you know, we have the IP tables that you'd be able to check up the, the API Gateway services outbound or the, the, the IP addresses for it. But alternatively, um, what you could do here instead is use a, um, now not a public Lambda function, um, but a NAT instance with uh, with yeah. Lambda <laughs> to actually enforce a fixed IP address or a NAT gateway. Um, so if you have your Lambda functions on a private VPC and, and have a, a NAT instance in between the uh, the private I, um, private VPC, or sorry, the private subnet and the public subnet uh, where your internet gateway would reside, uh, we'd be able to implement or ensure that we have the same public IP address for all the Lambda functions, outbound connections to the internet. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. And you know, uh, customers are going to use that when they need to be uh, allow listed on some uh, sort of external service, and they need to have a sort of uh, you know fixed IP to do that. So uh, yes, you can not directly, but uh, you know, 
also think of API gateways other than WebSockets is mainly internal traffic coming in. Uh, you know, an API outbound interface is going to be sort of via another a separate network, a separate uh, network um, uh, route. Uh, Okie dokie. Where are we? Um, yeah. So of course, uh, defining your metrics is very important. Um, of course, we have we have the latency metric, which is um, which is will track the overall latency from the request to the end response. The integration latency, which you can use to compare against the integration latency, which will allow you to determine how long it, uh, API Gateway t is taking to send the response or the request and response to the integration. So that integration latency should somewhat match the Lambda function's duration or the execution time of the Lambda function itself. Uh, we have our cat, uh, cache hits and misses. This is for the the um, uh, the REST API types that are edge optimized. Uh, of course, you won't see these with the regional API type. Uh, and you've got your 400 and 500 errors. So the 500 errors might be a little bit more important uh, if you are not controlling the 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 front end application, it'll let you know if there potentially is any service impairments uh, downstream. If you're suddenly getting 500 errors, something has clearly broken, and that could be a service impairment with with an AWS service or or one of your one of your providers or a Lambda function has been throttled or many different things. Uh, hopefully, your runbook is good that you can you can start looking at the logs. We'll talk about the logs in a bit, but um, right now we'll go on to. Is there any other uh, metrics here that we can we can talk about? Of course, you know API calls count for for HTTP latency, uh, latency, and the integration latency are the same thing here. Um, data processed, I believe, is in kilobytes. The amount of bytes that are sent from the uh, from the API itself. Um, I think there is a ten megabyte payload limit, or is it seven megabytes for for REST type APIs? Uh, there are limits, of course. You know, you, you can't be doing uh, huge. Uh, uploads and downloads from API Gateway. If you do need to do, or if you do need to do that sort of like uh, logic, we'd recommend using pre-signed URLs through S3 and and for a put object or a get object as well. So uh, that's how you could implement that instead. Actually, uh, we are, I mean we we don't have uh, that long. And I was going to mention I actually wrote a blog post series on building well-architected serverless APIs, and actually there was a section on that um, about understanding application health, which is you know part of the well-architected framework. And this was all on metrics, and there are a whole bunch of kind of things and specifically on the metrics that are useful to uh, error on as well. So. Yep. That might be uh, so oh you've got a link there perfectly. Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, cool. Let's uh, let's go talk about logging next. Uh, so uh, you know the, the, this these sort of screenshots don't really do it much justice. I I I, I was trying to see if I could quickly get one uh, up before this talk but we'll we'll just I guess deal with what we have here. Um, so with with API Gateway with REST types, we have two different sort of uh, levels of logging: uh, the error and the info. Um, logging is it's also capable to to log the full request response data, and this is fantastic if you are sort of building and testing and developing an API. Um, but something that is incredibly detrimental and dangerous to do in any production API. Uh, why is it dangerous? Well, first of all, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Each of these, each of these sort of lines here, is, is a put log event, uh, a a build uh, service interaction with CloudWatch. So we don't want to be doing this. And, and each request will will do. Oh gosh, it's like sixty four or or some large number of of requests to CloudWatch. Uh, so you do want to avoid that. Um, of course, the other reason why we don't want to be doing this with a production API is it will log everything. And I mean everything. So from yeah. the authorization headers to the body to the response, if there's any sort of confidential information in there, it's going to be going into CloudWatch. So avoid doing this if you can. Yeah, and I, yeah, I mean, I know you know customers I've worked with as well have, have landed up sort of scratching their heads, going, "Hang on, I'm running you know API gate with a, with a few lambda functions, but actually my logging bill is higher than my uh, lambda function bill, uh, and my API, API logging bill is higher than my API gateway and my lambda bill." So, uh, yes, you know, this is certainly something to something to think about and be clever with your logging, uh, and yeah, log what log what you need and elevate your logging if you have a problem. Exactly. Yep. You can see. Um, you can specifically change your your logging levels uh, reactively if you need to um, by monitoring something like the uh, the 500 error counts. Uh, if you see elevated errors, you can you can increase your your log rate with the likes of uh, X-ray. Uh, so increase the percentage of, of uh, requests that you're you're tracing, uh, which might help you uh, diagnose any uh, any service impairments for uh, quicker uh, at the expense of of an elevated X-ray bill. Uh, but yeah, yeah, something definitely to keep in in the back of your head when you're dealing with API Gateway and Lambda functions as well. Daniel, just time check. We have probably sort of uh, four or five minutes to go. So. Rightio. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, do you want to quickly talk about the, the service map here, uh, Julian? Is this any, of interest to you? 
<laughs> well, it's actually quite funny because Daniel and I were going through this earlier and he grabbed a screenshot and it's actually my name at the top. So this is taken from something I've uh, I've actually done before. Ah, oh, Fresh Tracks was an application my colleague Ben Smith put together many years ago. <laughs> uh, so that's useful. Yeah, X-Ray is fantastic uh, as even forget about the whole tracing kind of thing, which is cool. And you need tracing for your distributed applications. Um, X-Ray just shows you a graph of how your application connects together and can show the request of latency as it goes through your application. So uh, it's got colorful things. Something's red, you've got an error. If there's a, you know, something that's going a bit slow, it's going to be orange. It's just that visual thing, especially when you're building distributed applications, you've got a few different microservices. Um, the nice thing with about API Gateway is you just turn it on and it does its kind of thing. Uh, super useful. Also from a cost perspective, you can use uh, sampling with X-ray, so you're not using, you're not uh, paying for all of your requests. Uh, yeah, I mean, there would be, the only reason I would recommend not having X-ray for your serverless application is if you're already using distributed tracing via another third party yeah. vendor. So use distributed tracing, it's gonna you know, save your life. Um, you can get super clever with your traces when you can actually log information in your traces. It's going to make your logging and your discovery and your recovery so much easier because you go and you see something and you click on it and it's got some metadata in there which shows the you know, the microservice name that generated it and maybe an error code or that kind of thing. Super useful. Yeah, one of my favorite parts of, of X-Ray, Julian, will be when, when you're implementing it like this into a serverless application uh, and implementing it into Lambda using the using the SDK. Um, being able to see or, or, or have returned the uh, the individual sort of functions with within the lambda function, each each uh, task's yeah. execution time as well. So you can even uh, optimize your 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 code a lot more efficiently. You can see which parts of the function execution are actually slowing down your your overall request response latency. Uh, very useful to do if you're if you're in development. Uh, do look at, at uh, implementing it as XR if you can. Yeah, definitely. Uh, integrations. Uh, we have been through these before, but you know we can we can always talk about them again. Of course, there are uh, a myriad of the different AWS services available directly to API Gateway if you want to implement them yourself. Um, I've seen customers who are putting things like SQS in, uh, behind API Gateway and rebranding to put their own uh, domains on top of it. So if, if that's something that you need to do if you want to implement uh, a AWS service into your own custom uh, or into your own architecture, you can do it this way as well. Lambda functions very useful integration to to API. Gateway uh, will invoke the Lambda function synchronously, so you can return a body and send that back to the customer, including any additional headers. Uh, public HTTP endpoints, if you want to um, add authorization or manage authorization provided by AWS onto your own API running a, a somewhere else in the cloud or somewhere else on-prem, you can use the HTTP endpoints integration. Um, as well, as I mentioned, if there's a private API and you have isolated hosts in an EC2 environment, you can use this public HP endpoint for a private API as well to enable that um, th that exit of your of your isolated VPC to a specific endpoint that you have, of course, approved. And of course, on the way in, public to private uh, endpoints for your VPC. Uh, so you'll be able to use VPC link to implement uh, that that public API has access to private resources and isolated these students and so on. And then of course, via direct connect onto an on-premise system as well. So there's plenty of things we can do here. Uh, if you have any questions sort of about this, please just throw them in the chat and hopefully we can we can answer them before, before we're, we're closing up here. And finally, I just mentioned at the end there, but there is the private integrations via VPC link. Uh, so VPC link will allow you to attach a private internal load balancer or AWS cloud map to uh, an integration with an API gateway. So very useful, again, if you're trying to do that sort of public to private or private to private uh, with authorization, with the benefits of having API gateway. Uh, it is available to you there as well. Um, is that, uh, that's that's pretty much all we have here for the slides, but if there's any questions, we're more than happy to take them. Fantastic, Daniel. Yeah, we do have a question. I love Alpha Code's question before. We'd love to hear any interesting cases from Daniel's time in cloud support. So I'm gonna slightly rejig that question and say, what do people mess up, get wrong, misunderstand, or should do with their API gateways if there was you know, some tip, quick tip and trick that you can think that's where you should focus some energy in to get the most bang for your buck? Yeah, yeah. I I, I think the, the answer to this particular question that you've asked, Julian, is this whole topic that we've been discussing today, well architected with with serverless, with a serverless lens. Uh, from API Gateway, you know, it, it's hard to pick out one example. I, I've seen customers doing all the things I've told you today, the, the sort of pitfalls, um, like 
like uh, caching on cloud fronts, uh, confidential or uh, you know data that should be authorized. Big no no okay. to do that. Uh, logging full request response and getting uh, getting upset that your their, your bill is in the thousands of, of dollars. Um, there's there's plenty of different pitfalls with API Gateway. Of course, it is a fantastic service, but it can only it's only fantastic if it's being used right. And under the wrong hands, of course. Things, yeah. Exactly. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to think on the top of my head um, a, a no, that's funny great. sort of story, but yeah, there, there's plenty of different ones. If, no, you can think, things, yeah. if, if you can think of it, Julian, it has, I guarantee you it's happened to someone out there. Yeah, definitely. And just quickly, um, is the pricing the same for private versus public APIs? Uh, yes, from the API gateway perspective, but if you are adding WAF and other kind of things onto that, well, uh, well Web application firewall, that's going to uh, add additional kind of things. Quickly, we have a few seconds left. I actually wrote this whole blog post series, Building Well-Architected Serverless Applications, and I specifically went into the serverless lens and then teased out all the things and explained JWTs. I explained the token bucket algorithm. I explained caching. I did all that kind of stuff. So, And I did that about two, probably three years ago now, but a lot of that data is still super valid, uh, so it's super useful. Uh, thanks so much. We've literally run out of time. Next week, we're going to be talking about .NET 8 uh, run, uh, run time in AWS. Lambda, so thanks so much for spending time with us. Daniel, thanks for uh, stepping in and doing such a, a super great job. Uh, Zach, get better soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining. See you next week. Thank you, Daniel. Bye-bye.